If you find that your Rad Rover is underpowered for your needs, there is a solution. Watch how I install the 35 amp Bolton controller on my fat bike and find out whether it's worth the trouble and the price. You may be in for a surprise. I'm starting by showing how I install my controller, how to avoid the mistake that I made, and the order in which to carry out the installation. If you prefer to go directly to the comparison of the stock controller and the upgraded controller, fast forward to... This shows the new controller, the display, and the display mounting bracket. A major difference is that the Bolton controller is about 2 inches longer than the stock controller. That will require modifying the way it's mounted onto the seat post. This is the list of tools required for the job. Don't bother writing this down. You'll find the list in the video description along with the instructions. Next, I'll begin by showing you excerpts from an instruction video on the RAD website for replacing a RAD controller for another RAD controller, and I'll comment on the video where the instructions differ for the Bolton controller. Our bikes. Get the bike ready for maintenance. Turn off the bike, remove the battery, and press and hold mode to discharge remaining power. Then, unless you have a strong bicycle stand that can raise the bottom of the bike up to eye level, I would flip the bicycle upside down to work on it. Remove the three battery tray mounting bolts using a 4mm Allen wrench. Set the bolts aside and tilt the tray away from the seat tube to access the controller mounting bolts. Locate the controller and use a Phillips head screwdriver to remove the controller mounting bolts. The two bottom screws were very tight because they were installed with Loctite and there wasn't enough room for a normal screwdriver, so I had to use a right angle screwdriver. Here we see the bike right side up. Set the four bolts and the two mounting brackets aside. Unplug the wiring harness connector from the controller. To access the wiring harness connector, which is located inside of the down tube, snip the zip ties securing the cables at the bottom of the down tube. Turn the handlebar to the rider's right side. This is very important. Do this with a bicycle upside down. It's going to allow you to push more of the wiring harness, which connects to the display, inside the frame. This gives the cable more slack inside the frame, which makes it easier to pull more of the cable out of the bottom hole, and that makes it easier to unplug the connection. Then gently feed the wiring harness into the top of the down tube to create cable slack. At the bottom of the down tube, use a flathead screwdriver, preferably dull, and gentle pinching movements to carefully unseat the rubber grommet. Be careful not to damage the grommet or nearby cables. Using caution to avoid unplugging the wiring harness connector while it's still in the frame, gently pull the connector out of the opening while feeding more cable into the top of the down tube. Unplug the connector by pulling directly apart without twisting. Unplug all remaining connectors from the controller. Snip zip ties as needed and pull each side of the connector directly apart without twisting to unplug. Remove the old controller and recycle it according to local rules. Locate the new controller and orient it so the mounting holes face the front of the bike and the single cable points upwards. With the Bolton controller, the taillight cable comes out of the bottom with the other cables. That's a better solution because there's less chance of water seeping in that Place way. Place the new controller on the frame as shown. Pass the cables coming out of the bottom of the controller down through the opening between the frame tube. To secure the controller to the bike, pass 
Here the instructions show how to secure the controller back onto the seat tube, but I found that it's better to make all the connections beforehand because it allows more slack and the cables makes it easier to make your connections. Secure the controller to the bike, pass a mounting bracket through the top mounting hole on the frame, and thread in the bolts by hand. Repeat with the other bracket, tightening part way. Since the Bolton controller is longer than the stock controller, I had to install it with one bracket and a pair of bolts at the top end, and near the bottom end I tied it tight to the seat post with a tie wrap. Then I applied a bead of silicone seal about 6 inches long on each side. To plug in the wiring harness connector, pass the connector end through the grommet, then line up the internal notch and pins and external arrows and press directly together to connect. This nope. is where I really screwed up. Because the lighting wasn't optimal, and neither is my eyesight, I didn't have the connectors properly aligned, and some of the pins got bent. Uh, I wasn't successful at straightening them out, so I called Rad and I got connected immediately with a guy who understood what I wanted as soon as I called. Uh, so I told him the truth that I had bent some of the pins while repositioning the connections. And he didn't ask me why I had taken the connection apart and I didn't take the trouble to explain either. He kindly offered to send me a new harness on warranty, which was really unexpected and really nice. But because of the transportation problems that we're having these days, it took two weeks to receive the part, which deprived me of the bike for a couple of weeks. So my advice is to make sure that you have excellent lighting, that the bike is placed at a comfortable height for you, and that the two ends are perfectly aligned before pressing them together. And if you have bad eyesight, ask for help. It's called a wiring harness because at the top end it splits into five separate cables that feed the display, the switch, the brake cutoffs, and the headlight. Double check that the wiring harness connector is fully secure, then pass the connector through the lower cable opening and into the down tube. Reinstall the grommet starting with the long side of the grommet at the top or bottom of the opening then gently work the grommet around the opening until it's fully seated. At the top of the down tube, gently pull the wiring harness cable to create cable slack at the front of the bike. Plug in the remaining connectors. Locate the matching connector ends and carefully align the internal notch and pins and external arrows and press directly together without twisting. Replace any snip zip ties and trim them to be flush and smooth. Reposition the battery mounting tray against the front of the seat tube. Thread in the three bolts by hand and then use a 4mm Allen wrench to tighten the bolts evenly. Check that the battery tray is secure. Check that all cables are free from any moving parts. Rotate the handlebar to ensure it can move freely and that there is enough cable slack. Reinstall the battery, test the bike fully before riding, and ride rad. I found the installation of the display to be quite straightforward by following the instructions that came with the package. The new display comes with its own keypad, very much like the old one, but it's wired right into the display. The middle button is the on-off button, but also acts as a mode button, and we have an up arrow and a down arrow. To turn the display on, we do a long press on the middle button. And to turn it off, we do another long press to turn it off. So we'll turn it back on. 
When we turn the display on, it automatically lands on page one. At the top left of page one, we have the remaining battery power from one bar to four bars. Next to that is the voltage. This being a 48 volt battery, when it's fully charged, gives about 54 volts. To the right of that, we have the air temperature. Here in the garage, it's 15 degrees Celsius. In the middle, we have these large numbers which show your, your actual speed. When you turn the screen on, you will get, by default, you'll have one level of assistance. You can boost that right up to five levels of assistance, or you can take it down to zero if you don't want the motor to be assisting you at all. The other thing we see at the bottom here is the actual power that the motor is taking while you're riding. This will show you the power in watts. To the right of that, we have the elapsed distance and the elapsed time. If we toggle to screen two by pressing, by short pressing the uh, mode button, the differences here is that we have the average speed for this particular ride, and at the bottom we have the odometer and the total time that we've been riding the bike since it was new or since the controller is new. We can toggle now to, to page three by pr short pressing the mode button again. The only difference between page two and page three is that we have the maximum speed that has been attained during this ride instead of the average speed. We can go back to page one by short pressing the mode button, and here we are. If you want to turn the lights on, a long press on the up arrow, and you see the signal here. To turn it off, a long press on the top arrow. If you want to reset the time elapsed and distance elapsed, press on the up and down arrows at the same time. They start flashing and then press on the mode button. And there you are. One other thing is if you press and hold the bottom arrow, the bike will move at six kilometers an hour. So that is the walk mode. But before installing it, I'm going to run a test to determine the difference in power between the stock controller and the new controller. So to run that test, I'm going to ride the bike to the bottom of the hill on Pema Avenue. I'm at the bottom of the hill now, and I'm going to be testing two different parameters. I'm going to be testing the lowest speed at which the bike will slow down, and I'm going to measure the time it takes to get to the top. I forgot to say that I was also measuring the highest speed attained before reaching the point where it started slowing down. Unfortunately, I accidentally deleted the footage of the ride up the hill. In a way, it's probably a good thing, because otherwise you'd have to watch a very long, boring ride.
It's important to mention that all these tests were done under throttle only, no pedaling at all. This table summarizes the results of the two controllers. What I was looking at was the highest speed before the steep part of the hill, then in the hill itself the lowest speed in the steep part of the hill, and the time from the bottom of the hill to the top of the hill. With the stock controller, the highest speed that was attained before reaching the middle of the hill was 14.5 km an hour with the stock controller, but twice as fast with the Bolton controller at 29 km an hour. On the second line, the lowest speed in the steep part of the hill, the stock controller made the bike slow down to a crawling 6.8 km an hour, hardly enough to keep your balance. However, with the Bolton controller, it was a staggering 19.6 km an hour. What a difference! As for the time it took from the bottom of the hill to the top of the hill, 3 minutes 49 seconds with the stock controller and 1 minute and 39 seconds with the Bolton controller. Isn't that incredible? In case you're asking how much this wonderful controller costs, if you live in the United States it would be $229, which is pretty reasonable. But if you live in Canada you have to pay it in US dollars and you also have to add shipping, which comes to $251.75. But you also have to add the currency exchange which comes to $329.26, but you also have to add all the taxes that we have to pay in Canada, which comes to $53.64, and so the grand total is $382.90. There are two possible issues that I think could be problematic. For one thing, adding a lot more power than what the motor is designed for will cause it to overheat when it's under stress. So after climbing long hills, I'm going to dismount and feel the motor by touch to make sure that if it feels hot, that I would let it cool down before continuing. The limited tests I've done have all been in very cold conditions, so I can't tell if there will be overheating problems in the summer. The other issue I'll watch out for, but that I can't prevent, is the possibility of an axle spin-out. I heard that this can happen when the torque of a motor is so powerful that the axle turns in the dropout. The Rad Rover is equipped with a tiny torque arm that fits over the axle and screws onto the frame. I don't know how frequently axle spin-out happens. If it happened on your Rad Rover, I'd appreciate hearing about it. You can always get in touch with me by email at allorobert at gmail.com. Since I've done the comparative test, I rode the bike on snowpack trails and found that the extra power can make a huge difference, especially in softpack snow. In conclusion, this upgrade is a huge advantage and is going to make riding this bike a lot more enjoyable. I hope you found this video useful. If you'd like more information on e-bikes, bicycle campers or bicycle travel with a camper, and if you haven't already done so, subscribe to my channel or go to my website www.robertberio.com. Thank you very much for watching and remember, never quit cycling!